Welcome to what is uh, quickly becoming an annual uh, tradition here at the Researcher to Reader Conference. This is our, uh, our formal debate program. Um, before I explain how this is going to unfold, let me just share a quick item of housekeeping, and that is that at our next break at 3.15, um, there will be a, a repeat of some of the lightning talks, and those will be held in the, in the Paget Room, uh, where, where, they, uh, where they've been throughout the conference. Um, so the way this debate works is, uh, this, is a, this is a formal debate, um, and the way that we determine the winner is by seeing which side manages to move the most votes. So uh, the, a, a majority of the audience may already be either in favor of or opposed to the, uh, the proposition that's under debate today, um, but the winner will not necessarily be the team that ends up with the most votes in agreement. It will be the team that has moved the most votes. Um, so the way we determine audience agreement with the proposition is by taking an initial poll. And so I'm going to invite everyone now to go to slido.com. And you're going to see a slide here giving you the uh, code. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a moment to get there. And then I'm going to activate the poll. Okay, we're up to up to 88 votes. All right, I'm going to give it I'm going to give it 15 more seconds and then I'm going to call it. Right now we're at 91 votes. All right, I'm going to close out the voting now at 97 votes. We have 87% in favor and 13% opposed. All right, now I'm going to introduce our debaters. Uh, we will first, let's see, I've got my running order here. Uh, we will first hear from Malvika Sharan, um, who will be uh, offering an opening statement on behalf of her team in favor of the proposition. We'll then hear from Stephen Hefner, who will offer an opening statement uh, for the team against the proposition. We'll then have a response in favor of the proposition from Katrina, uh, from Katrina McCallum, and then a response against the proposition from Karen Wolf. Um, we will then have discussion with the audience. Uh, everybody, uh, obviously, everybody who's present in the hall is uh, welcome to come up to the mic. And I've also invited uh, those who are attending remotely to send questions in the chat, which I will read out. Um, and then when we are almost out of time, we will do the closing poll and we'll see uh, how and whether the results differ. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Malvika. Open practices actively facilitate transparent, participatory, collaborative, and ethical research by enabling the involvement of diverse stakeholders, including those impacted by their outcomes. Through transparent reporting, openness reinforces ethical standards, scientific rigor, and quality in research by opening up underlying data, research methods, and processes for independent scrutiny, building accountability and public trust. Open science is a discipline that encompasses various areas of research and promotes open ways of working, enabling equitable and inclusive approaches at all stages. For instance, open source software, open data standards, open education, citizen science, and open access utilize open practices to enhance the diversity of knowledge and knowledge producers, leading to greater cognitive justice. Despite a diverse set of goals and challenges across different sectors like academia, industry, government, and public sector, and different domains like arts, humanities, and social sciences, openness is the common thread that defines scholarship and advances the mission of making knowledge freely available for global access. Irrespective of the domain-specific challenges, open science contribute to producing public goods like publications, tools, data, practices, encourage greater collaboration among researchers and different disciplines, 
and broaden the diversity of knowledge producing actors. Transparency and openness have proven to improve research integrity and accelerate scientific and research through replication and reproduction efforts. The worldwide response to the COVID pandemic has shown just how impactful open practice in action looks like on global scale. Although stimulated by the urgency of tackling the crisis, it compelled the government, funders, researchers, and members of society to come together, gather all resources they needed, create systems of knowledge exchange, and prioritize human lives and public safety above all. To that end, UNESCO mobilized over 122 countries to promote open science and made a joint appeal to reinforce international co collaboration and cooperation to lift patents for vaccine equity. For equity to become a reality, it is important to explore to whom does knowledge belong? Who benefits from the production and circulation of research outcomes? Who gets to participate in the production process? And in what ways can research, you, can research be used to increase the agency of more people over knowledge production? I'm quoting contextualizing openness, situating open science, where research team led by Leslie Chan carefully emphasizes that open practices enable a knowledge uh, commons, recognize cognitive justice, practice situated openness, advocate individuals' right to research, foster equitable collaboration, incentivize inclusive infrastructure, and use knowledge as a pathway to sustainable development. Tragedy of Commons, a phenomenon popularized by biologist Garrett Hardin in 1968, is a common argument we continue to hear in 21st century. Ironically, this was precisely what Eleanor Ostrom debunked in the 80s and 90s. In her book, Governing the Commons, she highlights Hardin's quote, ruin is the destination towards which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the common. She states the limitations where Hardin focused on access without governance. He assumed little or no communication between people involved. He postulated that people act only in their immediate self-interest, and he offered only two solutions to correct the tragedy, privatization, or government intervention. I will add the fifth point, his analysis of pasture open to all and herders, or as he emphasizes all men, operate in absence of rest of the world without intersectional perspective, solidarity, or collective actions. Rather than assuming that open to all means accessible or beneficial to all, open practices work towards democratizing access to resources in which, in our case, that is funding, infrastructure, support such as at individual, institutional, geographical, and political levels. That diverse stakeholders need to address multifold challenge that affects them. Open practices are about access and reuse rather than open for exploitation or opening up without considering the ethical implications. Openness builds shared agency and operates to dismantle power imbalance in research culture, as well as infrastructure for co-creating solutions that are useful for everyone. The consequence of narrow, selective, or partial view can fuel an anti-commons or anti-trust agenda, leading to excessive intellectual property rights or over-patenting, resulting in privatization, vendor lock-in, commercial exploitation, and underuse of scientific resources. What is knowledge good for if it only makes the rich richer or does nothing to benefit the broader society? Isn't it highly unethical and in fact a violation of human rights when systems of knowledge choose not to address the exploitation of labor and extraction of knowledge from already marginalized and disadvantaged community? What role has Western notion of meritocracy and scholarship and Western notion of publishing and gatekeeping had in fueling this inequity? Since the release of Budapest Open Access Initiative 20 years ago, we have seen a social, economic, and technical shift towards openness. However, the unwillingness of research community, including publishers, to adopt the technological and cultural advances in infrastructure has blocked us from taking full advantage of what openness can offer. At the heart of this cultural impasse is the financial and reputational reward system that locks in the economic and academic capital of those already benefiting from the system and vulnerable members advocating for new systems of open scholarship are ejected before their career can get off the ground. There is a wholesale recognition of this challenge encapsulated in UNESCO recommendation for open science. It is primarily funders who are leading and driving the change. Welcome Trust, EU Commission, UKRI, and more recently, OSTP. 
These innovative funders are now transforming the policy landscape to encourage, enforce, and invest in open practices, easing the route to innovation that will serve not just the science, but all the society. Openness is not panacea, or a target in and of itself. It is an instrument, a tool, that we can use to improve research practice. Edge argument against open science minimize the complex, nuanced, and situated openness, and try to explain them through simplistic, reductionist, and highly unrealistic metaphor created to glorify the notion of free riders under the guise of academic freedom. Rather than upskilling researchers in best practices and transparent processes, the closed, elitist academic system expects researchers to hold the perverse incentive and assessment process. Justification of restricted access and close collaboration often comes from the assumption that researchers inherently want to participate in academic co competition and race to climb up on the leaderboard even though participation in such an unfair system is restricted for only those who are able to pay the access or contribution cost. Knowledge sharing is not competition. It is not a zero-sum game. We don't lose by sharing them. In fact, systemic progress depends on the knowledge of those who came before. Open practice allow us to expose and dismantle the restrictive, non-inclusive, and discrimin discriminatory status quo in the socio-technical infrastructure of research and help find ways of increasing trust, developing norms of reciprocity, and crafting new rules with all stakeholders of research. As an open educator, I can't finish my argument without mentioning FAIR principle that provides a framework for making all research objects findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. It is encouraged to be co-applied with care principle, leading to collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. Developed by the indigenous and allied researchers and practitioners, care demands the decolonization of practices and technology and safeguarding of vulnerable communities by protecting their knowledge such as land data and indigenous languages against exploitation. Radical collaboration and interdisciplinarity have allowed us to witness the emergence of good practices such as fair and care principle. Open sharing has also led to breakthroughs in research, be it example of big team science of human genome project, the distributed model of Wikipedia, the countless code base upon which data science continues to thrive, or the fact that COVID vaccines were made available in record time. Openness has proven itself time and time again for facilitating responsible research resulting in outcomes that are independently scrutinized, reused, and improved upon. In an era we are facing an unprecedented number of global challenges, ranging from pandemic, climate change, natural disaster, and even wars. We need to acknowledge open practices as our duty as researchers and members of society. I urge you to choose openness, more precisely transparency, interdisciplinarity, and collaboration to become researchers without border. Let's use our privilege and position to re-examine access and assessment for greater participation, improving research quality, reducing harm, and sharing benefits. Thank you. This debate is framed as whether open practices make science better. It is inconceivable that anyone here would argue otherwise. Openness, tr transparency, um, wow, should have gotten a piece of paper. Uh, openness, transparency, collaboration, co cooperation, these are essential to the research enterprise. A full exchange of data and ideas in a discursive space, free from bias and corruption, would be a difficult vision to refute and that debate would have little real-world practicality. We cannot, however, be debating the values in the abstract. Rather, we must be debating whether open science, which has come to mean a set of monolithic mandates for ma making published research freely available under certain terms, makes science better. Is openness, as it is currently being implemented, good for science? Here we think there is room for healthy debate. We submit that we're on a path to openness that has fundamental flaws ones that will significantly damage the scientific uh, enterprise. We further submit that these practices will damage our global polity by, by ignoring the broader context in which academic activity 
uh, happens, and sidelining, if not silencing, lines of inquiry fundamental to progress. From our vantage point, we see four major problems with open as currently conceived and being implemented. One, it fails to support and sustain a diverse and high efficiency scholarly communication system. Two, it fails to safeguard the incentive structure around high quality research, instead creating mechanisms in the marketplace that are incong incongruent with the objective of truth seeking. Three, it fails to account for the sharp differentials among disciplines in how research is conducted, prepared, and shared to the great detriment of our social fabric and our civic health. And four, it fails to understand how the research enterprise unfolded over the last hundred years and demands we prioritize free consumption above all else. We start with alterations in funding. The movement from reader to user pay, uh, reader or user pay models of scholarly publishing will remove a significant amount of money from the ecosystem. In the current subscription-based environment, upwards of 40% of publisher revenue comes from institutions that have no research output at all. These read-only customers are primarily, but not exclusively, corporate customers from the R&D intensive sectors, some of the largest companies in the world, pharma, biotech, healthcare delivery, technology, aerospace, and energy. In a fully open access, author pays world, these institutions will not be paying in. They'll be getting a free ride. But regardless of whether one thinks this is fair, this money will no longer contribute to the ecosystem. There's an assumption in the open movements that the entire infrastructure is a given. Metadata standards, linking structures, archiving services, abstracting, indexing, bibliometrics, fraud detection, etc. These functions were primarily built by and continue to be funded by scholarly publishers. Innovation in the space, too, depends on continued investment to develop new ways to move faster, share data, encourage collaboration, identify misconduct, and enforce norms. Is there a better way to fund the shared ecosystem and drive progress? Perhaps, but that's not, that is certainly is, is, that is the, not the current trajectory and which naively and recklessly defunds the enterprise that we all believe in and with no conception of how to replace those resources. Two, this leads to our second point, which is regarding mis misaligned incentives. Open access mandates as they are currently being implemented set up perverse incentives that will impede and corrupt the scientific endeavor. The goal of research is to advance human knowledge, and scholarly communications facilitates this truth-seeking by bringing the best information forward for the widest possible group of scholars to synthesize and to build upon. Vital to that dissemination of scholarly output is a disinterest in anything other than quality process and output. Publishers must be agnostic about the source of the knowledge generation, the wealth of, or political ideology of the funders, and the conclusions of the research. They need to provide a fair, rigorous, and trustworthy application of peer review and an even-handed, useful presentation, the objective being quality science for the community of scholars and practitioners. Publishers and other intermediaries are incentivized in this endeavor by the approbation of the users, the consumers. When they compete in this marketplace, publishers have incentive to produce more rigorously vetted content in a form suited for maximum quality. In the open access environment, the incentives for high quality output fade. Driving revenue is a simple value, uh, volume calculation. Publish more papers, regardless of quality. And we've already seen that there are plenty of commercial concerns willing to publish as many articles as academia can pay for. And make no mistake, these publishers have a willing accomplice in academia at all levels, which continues to incentivize output at a furious pace, publish or perish. But this is not a question of whom to blame. Academia's promiscuity and their promiscuous output of underwhel uh, underwhelmingly mediocre papers or commercial publishers' voracious appetite for APCs. Neither of these innate characteristics, ambition or avarice, can be fixed. Rather, as in all human systems, they need to be mitigated. So it ought to be a question, rather, of how a system minimizes the temptations of these groups to realize their worst instincts and instead incentivizes the creation of good science and the rejection of junk. The current vision for open access does neither of these things, but rather solidifies the unholy alliance of these pernicious behaviors. And the result will be, and already is, a scholarly literature flooded with mediocre science, or worse, destructive misinformation, produced and published at scale with fewer tools from a defunded discovery and curation industry. Three, current policy and mandates around open practices fail to account for the sharp differentials among disciplines in how research is conducted, prepared, and shared. 
The in insensitivity, insensitivity to the diversity of academic practices gives priority to the biggest volume and most well-funded fields, rather than allowing a critical assessment of social needs to drive our practices. This debate is framed around open science, but it's really about open research more broadly, and only in some particular places does science include the arts, humanities, and social sciences. The major drivers of openness are narrow, biomedical science in particular, and not even foundational fields such as mathematics or much less social sciences like economics. But as much as we need medicine and what technology brings us, we need the humanities as much, if not more. History, for example, is a vital perspective for understanding our experience. Autocrats know this. It's no accident that powerful entities are attacking historical knowledge and research. History is empowering. Open science ignores the low-cost, highly distributed way that the humanities are funded and the intensive, highly skilled editing and preparation required to create carefully articulated work. This is labor mostly supplied by the nonprofit publishers. Humanists expect their work to serve the public good, and they commit tirelessly to public engagement, vital messages built from the expert work they circulate and publish among the community of experts. The mandates for openness make this work, which underpins all other inquiries, substantially harder, if not impossible, to pursue. It seems the height of folly that we would consider creating an entirely new, more complex, and more costly system with a less editorial mediation and, and the necessary labor to replace the journals in the humanities and social sciences that cost libraries mere hundreds of dollars a year annually. We cannot allow these critical fields of study to become the collateral damage of a primarily biomedical research ideology. These fields are not incidental, they are fundamental. And fourth, open science mandates ignore all other urgent research issues and prioritize free consumption above all other virtues in the, in the enterprise. Open science conceives all issues as related to free and immediate online access and prioritizes easy consumption of research. We see this differently. The research enterprise in the West is a product of two historical moments, late 19th century disciplinary commitments to empirical methods and the mid 20th century expansion of funding for science largely as part of national security, both primarily first world phenomena. In a world where we need to think about global cooperation in facing the major crises of our time, the imperiled climate, the, the imperiled climate and imperiled democracy, shouldn't we pull ourselves out of the constraints of that first world and Western context? Isn't it, in fact, imperative to empower researchers around the world, and particularly the global south, for the global public good? But instead, the late 20th century economy has prioritized cheap consumption, and often to the detriment of workers to the global south, the mo open movement likewise emphasizes cheap consumption of research and through its author pays models makes it difficult or impossible for researchers in the global south to participate. In short, the calls for open are well intentioned. They ask for the things in theory we should all want. However, in practice, this movement is driving an inversion of the very things we profess to value. Is free access for theoretically needy users so valuable that we are willing to decimate a funded system of interconnectivity? sacrifice a centuries-old method of values alignment around quality and scholarly output, seed a robust interdisciplinary understanding of human progress in, for the best funded, to the best funded fields, and further complicate a diverse global participation in a solution to our common problems, we, in opposition to the proposal, say no. Well, <clears throat> with respect to our honourable colleagues, their four arguments depend on a series of fundamental fallacies. They mistake a business model for open access, and a business model of open access with the practices and principles that make up open science practices. And then they conflate the ability for others to access, discover, reuse, and contribute to research with torrid notions of consumption. And in relation to the deep inequities and lack of support for open infrastructure, where do we even begin? Thank God for funders. Open practices wouldn't have got off the ground if it were up to researchers, scholarly societies, and publishers. 
They stated that vital to the dissemination of scholarly output is a disinterest in anything other than quality. And yet they fail to recognize that the perverse incentives they deplore have been fueled by a lack of transparency and a deeply inequitable system of gatekeeping. The system they want to keep intact for the sake of quality has created the hyper-competitive culture that is causing the problem. A lack of willingness to share information in case you get scooped. The black box of peer review where bias is rife. Um, the gatekeeping of knowledge that bars anyone who is different from having an influence on the system. The publishing system they extol has been propped up by privileged and profitable brands run as much by not-for-profit societies as well as commercial publishers. Brands that have locked in the supremacy of the global north both academically and financially. There is already more than enough money in the system to help fund open practices. It just requires redistribution. The irony of their argument is that, is that it is actually... Oops. The irony of their argument is that it is actually increased openness that will help drive down costs and mitigate against the problems. It is the willingness to share data about what works and what doesn't that has helped expose the lack of scholarship and research integrity in this so-called academic meritocracy. Making your work open makes it available for public scrutiny and not just for academic peers. It makes us accountable to everyone in society. Moreover, they make the argument that humanities should somehow be exempt from such open practices. To refer back to Ostrom, they believe the humanities are falling prey to the tragedy of the commons and should therefore be a privileged edge case, ring-fenced off from the rest of science. If, as they say, humanis humanists expect their work to serve the public good, then why don't they make their work a public good by opening it up for everyone? Do the humanities not have rigorous scholarship and methodologies that should also be shared and independently scrutinized? Are humanities and history not subject to the same biases and inequities created by a lack of transparency that has, exposed the, uh, that has been exposed in biomedicine? And why on earth should biomedicine alone reap the benefits of open science? I agree wholeheartedly that the humanities are important, way too important to be closed off. Golly. I'm ready to go. Okay. Thank you. In the three minutes allotted, carefully, we'll respond to two points in our colleagues' opening statement and then return to the primary point of ours. First, our colleagues ask, quote, to whom does knowledge belong? Invoking vaccines and the pandemic crises, they call for, quote, the production and circulation of scientific knowledge to benefit everyone. Yet the very framing of the question betrays the problem. Knowledge does not exist independent of either contexts or resources. It literally does not grow on trees. So even if we could shift the ownership of the land and access to the orchard, knowledge isn't an apple. It's a complex and often ephemeral human product shaped by a set of institutional and other relationships. Second, our colleagues lament that while there has been a, quote, social, economic, and technical shift to open, researchers and publishers have been resistant. They are, well, we are, I guess, quote, blocking us from taking full advantage of what openness can offer. But let us be clear, we are not team no. We are not team Luddite. We are not team elite, greedy hoarders of research either. And neither are we team clueless, unthinking, legacy publishing, addicted lemming researchers. Move fast and break things is very Elon Musk 1.0. Even if Elon hasn't moved on from that mode, I think we have. Moving at deliberate pace and building, repairing, recycling, and repurposing is what the world has learned to value again. Yesterday, we heard a chemist, in fact, raise many of the same questions we raised about open access from a researcher perspective, about equity, about the lack of consultation, about the priorities of researchers, calling for a return to values that drove people into science and into research communities in the first place. So we are not arguing against openness and accessibility, but rather open access mandated policies. We are team context. We are team deliberate process. We are team collaborative research practices for the public good. 
As a historian, I have long lamented the ways that OA policies are making it harder, more expensive, and more time consuming to just publish good humanities research at the very moment when the world is in the direst need of history, at the very moment when universities are cutting humanities faculty and majors, when politicians around the world are making it harder, even illegal, to teach evidence-based history, when democracies are threatened and autocrats are ascendant on a rising tide of historical misinformation and myth, at this very moment when, in fact, we need more humanities research for accelerating, accelerating crises that are not entirely technical or technological, but deeply social and political, we will not have historians to meet these urgencies. Recent studies of the US and Canada make this plain. In Canada, of the 500 historians earning a PhD in the last five years, 10% earned a tenure track position. You may ask what this has to do with OA. It, and I would answer you, but Rick won't let me. I guess technically someone could ask that question. Uh, I don't know if that would be cheating, but. Okay, so um, thanks so much to our excellent uh, debating sides. Uh, it, the time is now yours. I need to make sure that I don't go over time. We've got until 2.15, 2.30, good. Uh, so the time is now yours to pose questions and make comments. Um, we have got uh, one comment from our, uh, from our illustrious leader, Mark Carden, uh, says Def it's definitely important to remember that Researcher to Reader is not an STM conference, but a conversation about the whole of the academy. What else? What questions do we have for our group? Or do you want me to give you a half hour of free time? I, I, have, I have a really hard time believing that nobody has any questions or comments. Please, Heather, go ahead. As one of the historians in the room, I feel like I have to ask the question to Karen, what does this have to do with open access? <laughs> yeah, there's a microphone for each of you there. Can you hear me? Is that better? Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much, Heather. If I had had 30 more seconds, what I would have said is that what this has to do with OA is creating policies and scholarly communication that are really meant for biomedical or for the hard sciences and applying them across the board to every disciplinary endeavor. I would answer Katrina. I totally take your point that the humanities should be available for the public good. In fact, I don't know any historians or humanists who aren't actually working their butts off to make that possible. But the production of expert intense uh, uh, scholarship journal publication is not necessarily the thing. In fact, we're producing all kinds of work for the public good that are meant to reach exactly these kinds of um, critical, critical issues. So it does, what it has to do with OA is the way that OA is fit for a certain problem and then generalized um, more broadly. I think all of us could agree that openness is great, but what's not great is kind of narrow and monolithic policies which are being applied so broadly at the very moment when we're undervaluing, in fact, the diversity um, of human knowledge. I would say that, you know, biomedical is huge in scholarly communications. We all, we all know that. But it isn't huge in human knowledge at the same proportion. Please. I think, there's, I think there's two things. One, one, this debate is not about open access, it's about open practices. And the other thing is that, the, the, yes, it's, it's happening first in the biomedical sciences, but there's, uh, and there's been huge experimentation, massive pushback from researchers um, um, and, and the publishers, and we found that some of the things that we started out with are not working. I think the APC model itself is deeply inequitable. Um, and that, uh, but that does not mean it's an excuse not to have open practices. The humanities are developing their own means of open access, and, and this is often talked about at this very conference. They're experimenting with different ways and, and showing the benefits of that. And that's what's required, a commitment to invest in that, to experiment, to work out what's wrong, what's right, but not to just dismiss 
open access or open practices because another discipline has done it and you, seem, you, you feel it's being imposed on you in that way. There's so much being done. There are entire regions of the world that have different models of open access to the APC model which haven't been addressed here, for example. Anyone else? Um, I, 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 I take your point that this is not a debate about open access and particularly not about the financial, financial mandates in open access, but they are a key piece of the puzzle because they are also the way, the, uh, for example, open data sharing, structures need to be, done, uh, to be built for that. Uh, I, I, I go back to the point that even if it's not about open access, particularly in APCs, it is about how much resource uh, exists in the system and the overall funding of the system is imperiled, especially if we're going to add the burdens of how are we going to uh, conceive of a metadata schema for data, uh, and how are we going to make that discoverable, how, where are we going to put it, et cetera, et cetera. I also am very concerned that, um, that, that the defunding, act, and I didn't focus on this, but probably should have, uh, the defunding makes a very big difference for research integrity. Uh, right now, the keepers of the flame uh, are, are, are pretty much the process uh, doers. So the, the publishers, the, especially the learned societies that enforce the norms, and disintermediating them by taking the, the money out of the system is, um, is a, a significant problem for science generally. I'm going <laughs> to, um, I, I am not from the publishing business side and I am really like, I, I work with researchers, working with data, I, I teach them how to code, how to share data. I do not really care what about, you know, what's the circulation of money happening in publication infrastructure. What I care, are researchers able to do the research? Uh, Jen just entered, Jen from Data Dryad. I was just talking to her about helicopter researchers. They fly in, they collect data, they go back, they publish results. What happens to the place where they collected data from? What happens to the researchers who contributed to research? Those are not given fair credit, and that's not fair. That's the problem I'm talking about. Of course, there are like, you know, monetary issues. That is definitely not my mind to solve. I'm really glad you all are thinking about it. What I want to make sure that at all stages of research, People are able to contribute, get acknowledged for their work, and benefit, not just getting extraction of knowledge on their side. So therefore, again, sure, publication is, is one part of it, but I see it as not just publication of paper, but publication of data, software, code, methods, work protocols, anything, and that is just not about APC anymore. All right, we have another question that's come in on the, on the online platform. This is from Tasha Mellons Cohen. The question is, if not open, what? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I think um, open, of course, op I think we've said openness is great. It's like love and clean air. Like we are, openness is a, is a good thing. But open policies, I would say public good Honestly, I think so many of the things that you just talked about in terms of responsibility um, to local communities um, among researchers wherever they are, absolutely. And in fact, that's essential to my disciplinary practice. Um, the library that I direct has a commitment to 100% digitization of our collection and fully open access. And it is, 30% of it is open now. We're not like, no, you should keep it all locked away, not at all. But what we do, uh, resist mightily is these kinds of structures that impose burdensome um, kind of policies that make it harder for us actually to innovate for what we truly believe is in the public good. So Tasha, I guess I would say public good. That's how I would replace it. I feel like open has become so complicated. Um, but public good, um, that's, what, that's what I would offer. Maybe it seems semantic, but it isn't to me. I, I won't respond much. I, I, I'm, there's ways of talking. Uh, I think public good means different things to different people. I mean, for me, a public good, well, just don't put any license on it. Make it a public domain on all your work. Um, that, uh, you know, that's one expression. That's another debate. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, an, uh, that's, a, that's another uh, um, expression of it. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know where to begin, actually. Perhaps going back to... I mean, it, what is the option of not open? It's not, it's not just about love and hot air. 
this is this clean is air. clean air, love and hot air, clean air. Yeah, it is hot air, hot air. Uh, um, it's it's a. I mean, there, there is so much evidence that actually collaboration sharing has been shut down by the system, and um, there is also plenty of money. There's been numerous studies in the system to pay for much more openness. The infrastructure and metadata, I agree, that needs huge investment and it's the right thing to do, but we should be talking about open metadata and open infrastructure, and it is not the publishers that are investing in that and promoting that. Um, in fact, it comes from outside publishers, it comes from much more the data, the data platforms. All of that takes money. The money is in the system. There's, it, there's huge amounts of money in scholarly publishing that can go elsewhere, and there needs to be extra investment in data repositories, speaking to Malvika and ways of doing things. We need some kind of little card where we say, I disagree on this point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can't, I, this, 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 the fantasy that there's vast amounts of money in the, in the scholarly publishing system to do whatever it wants is, is kind of silly, and it, 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 because it, it's not true. Uh, if it were true, then then um, we wouldn't probably be having uh, any resistance to the to the concept. The the truth is, all of the great little services we've seen presented in the lightning talks and here on stage, for example, the archiving folks, etc. Uh, a good deal of that comes from directly from scholarly publishers. So. Uh, I'm not necessarily even saying that you couldn't find that money elsewhere, but the truth of the matter is you're going to have to find that money elsewhere because if you put these commercial concerns in the position of being defunded, they will start to cut the services and this argument will become more and more about individual patches of ground, like are we going to now provide archiving? Are the funders now going to mandate that you archive? Am I going to provide an XML version? Are the funders going to mandate that we provide an XML version? So I feel like that it, it almost becomes um, a fight to be Southwest Airlines or Ryanair and start cutting, now we're going to charge you for a bag, now I'm going to charge you for the, this, and I just don't think that that's going to be a profitable way for the industry, to, or the, the ecosystem to move. I'll let the next question come in. Uh, go ahead, Phil. Hey, so, um, I think it's reasonably uncontroversial to say there's quite a bit of evidence now that there is a problem with research reproducibility or research integrity or the quality control of research. Um, and I think all the panelists have alluded to that. Um, what I see as very interesting is there's almost two ways of looking at solving this problem that I see in, in the industry. One is from largely coming from a publisher perspective around uh, editorial quality control, almost an enforcement thing. You know, can we detect when things are going wrong? Can we police? the output. And then from the open science side or the open research side, it's more about if we make it transparent, if we make it open, you can create a paper trail and then you can see when people are cheating, when people are, are breaking the rules. Are these two approaches somehow mutually exclusive? Is it just that we can't afford to do both? Why don't we approach this from purely a research integrity question and, uh, and try and tackle it from both directions? Excellent point, and it's been it's it's been done. Embo F1000, they actually have very transparent way of publishing the review points, um, and it's great. Uh, at the same time, as you talked about fraud detection, is is one of the areas where a lot of um, algorithms have been implemented in, within the infrastructure of uh, open access. However, most of the work are freely done by volunteers, people who would like to solve that problem or PRJ or open access platforms where people are calling out fraud. And even though some of the papers have massive problems and frauds are called, the papers are not retracted because someone paid for that to be published in a system that really wants that to happen in that place. So excellent point. It is possible. It is possible only through the system where people and organization and funders are willing to do uh, or, or invest in that, those kind of infrastructure. So just, just to, oh, sorry, can I please. just add to that? Because I think Phil's point is really important. We, we should have both. And, and the, the, we need more transparent to expose the problems. Uh, uh, um, and this also applies to publishers. We actually need to make it much more transparent about the services that are being provided, including peer review, 
transparent peer review would expose <coughs> fraudulent actors, make it much harder for them um, um, to do their work. It would also expose the editorial rigor um, that is happening at journals. Um, and price transparency, uh, uh, this would expose actually what it is we are paying for. Uh, all of this, so transparency just doesn't apply to researchers. It applies to, to publishers um, as well. The evaluation system, how that works, is completely opaque. All of this uh, can, be, can be subject to independent scrutiny. And openness is a tool. It's not a panacea. It's a tool to actually have better quality research and better quality publishing. Well, I, I have to refute that it's completely true. Opaque. Uh, you know, the, the processes within our, with our within the IEEE system are, are very well known. The policies are are written down. The the way peer review is conducted is uh, is open. Now, the, uh, reading the actual reviews and knowing the identities of peer reviewers is is not is still considered inappropriate in our community. I, that would be something you'd have to take up with our scholars. Uh, but uh, uh, but the but the way we do what we do is is uh, is completely transparent. I just wanted to note on the question of open peer review um, in my field, uh, that's, that's been rejected time and again it, precisely <coughs> to um, eradicate more sexist and racist bias, frankly, in the field. That anonymous review has actually advantaged the careers and the deeply important scholarship of particularly women of color who have done some of the most important work in my field in the last 10 years. So, um, I, you know, transparency isn't always isn't the, the answer. I mean, I think, so this is my point, is that I think there are many things we agree on, but some of the things that you say, I don't even recognize the world that you're, you're talking about, <laughs> frankly. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, there are different ways to get to ethics, integrity of research, public service. There are different routes, I think. Um, just to say, in talking about transparent peer review, I'm not saying reveal the identity of the reviewers. I'm just saying publish the reviews. That's all. Um, it's, it, at the moment, it's far too threatening for early career <coughs> researchers to reveal their name because of the power dynamics. Make the reports transparent, and we can do that. And then this, this starts to get exposed. You're going to have to just like shut us off or something. But actually, for us, it wouldn't work because the nature of the research is such that you would know the identity from reading the review and the particular expertise. That's what I'm saying. So the anonymity would be would uh, on. So you couldn't have a junior scholar doing this review there. Anyway, so the reviewer themselves. Anyway. So I I think I am going to move us on to the next question. Before we go to you, Richard, there is an uh, a, there is another question on the platform. Uh, it's from Joe Appleford Cook, and the question is, are the panelists advocating actively pulling back on current sharing practices or just a halt to pushing further ahead? I think that's addressed to Karen and Stephen. Well, I mean, you know, Steve and I are not um, completely unified on this, right? We're, we come from different perspectives and different <coughs> disciplinary vantages. Um, what I'm asking for is a deliberate pause and a reflection on what it is we actually value and what it is we actually need, what does society really need. Um, so, you know, at every stage I have asked for a kind of a pause and a more diverse approach to open practices. Um, and that is 100% that is all and everything that I am asking for now. I, I, agree, I agree with that. It would be lovely to have uh, not a pause, um, but a discussion about the context and uh, in which open access is done, in which open science is done, and how best to achieve that without disadvantaging already disadvantaged groups. Yeah, I, we, we do have a slightly different perspective, Karen, and I, even though we're on, on, uh, on team constructive, what were we, team constructive something? Context. Team context, that's <laughs> us. Um, uh, absolutely not uh, talking about walking things back. We are, you know, we're actively moving towards this future that we envision, but, uh, but A, I was asked to be team no, so I gave it my best. Uh, but, 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 <laughs> but two, I, I think that really it's, it's just about not glossing over what conflicts and perversions we see in the current um, uh, thrust and um, and how do we mitigate that? It it, it does not. It is it, it incumbent upon the changers to work this out. 
not upon the incumbents to work this out. So um, it, we've got a system that functions and uh, it has its problems, but uh, some of these problems are much larger, uh, the ones that I see coming, so I'd like to see uh, those addressed before we move forward. Not a pause, because I think there's, there's so much good that can come of all of these things that we should be pushing forward on them, but let's not be uh, um, uh, foolhardy. Okay, um, I think we'll go to Richard, and then I think after that, we may be uh, about out of time, but let's see. Go ahead, Richard. Um, thanks, Rick, and apologies for bringing it back to the business model. Um, Stephen, there's no more traditional publisher than the one I work for, annual reviews. All the things that you said about uh, the traditions of publishing, I agree with, but it doesn't actually cost any money to remove the paywall. And there are ways that uh, we can maintain the um, funding that we get. For instance, we use a model called subscribe to open, which you appear not, not to have considered, where we simply ask the subscribing institutions to continue to pay for the journals on the understanding that when the journal is funded, it's published open access. Um, we are implementing it for all 51 of our journals this year, and I'm very confident that they're all going to be converted to open. And that includes, we don't have any humanities journals, but we've got um, many social sciences journals. And the social scientists on our committees and our authors are extremely supportive of the move to open access. So I think there is maybe a way of having our cake and eating it. Um, it may, might be a bit too early to declare that that's the case, and I know that uh, I, well, I'd like to hear what criticisms there are of this, but in theory, a very large part of, uh, of the traditional publishing industry could simply convert by everybody agreeing we'll continue to do what we're doing right now, but we won't have a paywall. Do you think that that's a valid possibility? Um, well, I saw you stand up, so I knew we were gonna talk about subscribed open, so. Uh, um, uh, but uh, I, we're all happy that this is put working out for annual reviews. We'd love to see how it, how it plays out in the future. I mean, there are sub several assumptions around um, uh, S to O. Uh, one is that uh, librarians committed to the fundamental transformation of the industry will be the ones in charge of the budget 15 years from now? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the other is still it does not mitigate the problem of, of, of the uh, read-only subscribers from the corporate world because the altruism of the, uh, of, of, the, of the Lockheed Martins of the world that fund a lot of the work that uh, IEEE is doing, I, I fear for, for, for those con commercial concerns and that money coming out of the system. And in fact, um, our sales director is anticipating that because we'll see more usage of our content in industry, that we'll be able to go and attract more revenue from um, corporations rather than losing it, uh, which will help um, hopefully lowering the, the cost or at least defraying the increases for, for the academic publishers in the future. Um, and as far as... Um, Librarians are, are doing the right thing, but higher-ups in institutions aren't. Um, I, we have, I haven't seen any evidence for that so far. Uh, I think that there's um, a realization that, as, as everyone has identified here, open is the right thing to do, and everybody needs to do their own part to make it, to make it work. Great. Just to add to that, I think we need to acknowledge we're living in 21st century. We don't just need to read a paper. There are so many ways to actually access data and knowledge. And Jupyter Notebook, for instance, like if you don't know how to code, you can still go and scrutinize what that code does and what data do they use. Why do we need to worry about what's behind the paywall when people these days are publishing preprints, self-archiving, local libraries? There are so many different ways. So I don't, I don't, that's why I keep on going back to the, the conversation where it's like, why are we even talking about just publishers? This is really about academic system and, and multiple diverse ways to publish and share knowledge with people who needs it. Um, 
Yeah, so let's acknowledge that publication of paper is one of thousands way to share data and knowledge. And I think that's where we have to leave it. Uh, so I'm gonna ask that the Slido poll be put. First of all, would everybody please uh, uh, share our appreciation for our excellent debaters. Um, now, here's a very, very important reminder. If you voted at the beginning of this program, please vote again. If you did not vote at the beginning of the program, do not vote now, because what we're trying to measure is how many of the votes that were tallied at the beginning have now changed. Uh, so, yep, if you go to slido.com, please enter that code, and then I'll ask our magic technicians to put the code up, and I will... Activate it. All right, the poll is now open. That is that the current one? Okay. Yeah. The code is uh, four four. Uh, sorry, four one four. Zero six zero nine four one four zero six zero nine. And if you're voting against me, I'll give you a different code. <laughs> <laughs> it is looking pretty clear that the nays have it. Yeah, the, the nays have moved the most votes. So whereas it was, at the beginning, it was 98% in favor and 2% against, it's now 69% in favor and 31% against. And that proportion seems to be holding. I'll give it 15 more seconds and then we're gonna call it. But unless there is a huge silent majority of eyes out there, I think we're going to be able to declare Karen and Stephen the winners. Congratulations. Congratulations.